shamans and ceremonies for over 4,000 years. It was his experiences with the vine which led to his latest work in his first novel, Entangled, which we have over here, written in the same page-turning appeal that has made his nonfiction so popular. It tells the story of the supernatural battle of good against evil, fought across the dimension of time and the human plane. And I have to say, the, the language that he uses in the book is fascinating, because it takes place in two time periods, sort of the Neanderthal time period and the future, the near future. Present. The present, right? <laughs> and um, so the use of language, and I think how we can apply many of the themes in the book to today, from the Neanderthal period too, is fascinating, and I really highly recommend it. And I have a suspicion that not everything in that book is fiction. But you'll have to find that out for yourself, but he's calling it fiction. Anyway, I'm thrilled to have these two gentlemen here tonight, and after they speak to each other for a little while, we will take questions and answers. So please welcome Daniel Pinchbeck and Graham Hancock. strange sort of uh, intergenerational thing for me here because my grandfather was a preacher, a Church of Scotland preacher, and now I find myself with a pulpit <laughs> sitting in church. Quite, quite extraordinary. Uh, actually, it's the second time I've crossed the path of my grandfather because when I climbed the Great Pyramid, I found his graffiti at the top of the Great Pyramid. <laughs> he'd, he'd scrawled it into the stonework on the 5th of April, 1916. So anyway, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's great to be here. Um, Danny, uh, you have uh, two new works out. You have uh, a book and a film. And I think it would be great to kick off if you could tell us a bit about both of them and how they intersect. Uh, thank you. Yeah, really nice to be back here also. It's a beautiful church. Um, well, tomorrow night, actually, the film is going to be playing in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, at 7.30 p.m. at the Warehouse Theater, which is 645 New York Avenue, uh, Northwest uh, 20001. And we're actually going to be there with uh, Gilberto Gil. Do you know who he is? Uh, he was the Minister of, of Culture in, in, in Brazil and one of their most famous uh, musicians. He's interviewed in the film, and we're actually going to be doing some stuff at Greenfest in Washington, D.C. tomorrow. Uh, panel discussion with him at three, and then he's going to be there for the screening and, and Q and A after the screening also. So the film is called 2012: Time for Change, and um, it's a documentary that I uh, worked on with the director Joao Alvarez for the past maybe three years, and uh, it kind of takes off from you know where my last book, The 2012 Return of Cancer Bottle, ended, and it is very related to the new book also in that it's kind of like going beyond the theory about you know. What do these indigenous cultures think or know about this time? These traditional cultures, you know, what 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 kind of time is it? To to then, you know, what what are the practical solutions? What can we do going forward that that, that could make a, a difference? And so the film uh, starts with kind of shamanism, uh, you know, a spiritual crisis. Um, we look at uh, my own work in West Africa with the boga, then we talk about with, with Rockstar Sting about taking ayahuasca in Brazil. We talked to the David Lynch about transcendental meditation. A number of uh, yoga yoga uh, teachers and leaders of the yoga community talking about the benefits of yoga. So then we look at like how you kind of get an elevated perspective through this type of inner work, and you're able to kind of be more dispassionate around the, about the world around you. And then what are the solutions that are available for us right now? So um, we take the, the film, and I talk about him in the book too, uh, we look very much at the ideas of uh, Buckminster Fuller, who was a design scientist, very famous in the, in the 20th century, who had this whole uh, idea that um, you could, um, you know, that, that the, way, the way our design had been, had been working was kind of against nature, we were kind of like forcing nature, and actually what we needed to do was figure out how nature operated, figure out the operating uh, principles of nature, and then, and then work from there. And um, so we look at design science uh, in agriculture, uh, urban design, kind of echo city design. Uh, we talk about uh, redesigning the monetary system. Uh, we interview a very interesting guy, Bernard Leotar, who um, also have an essay about, about in, in, in this book, who, um, yeah, who, who, who was one of the architects of the Euro and has been looking at how the, the way that our, that our money system, our financial system is structured, how it uh, supports 
certain types of aggressive, competitive, and unsustainable behavior, and how redesigning the, the, the monetary system, or at least adding complementary currencies, can support different uh, types of human behavior. So um, yeah, so, so, so the, and, and the book, you know, as I said, is really kind of similar. Like it, it charts my thinking over the last three to four years from the last book, which was very philosophical. When that book came out, uh, I, the question I got most from people is, um, you know, what do I do? You know, if I understand some of what you're talking about, and if I see that we are in this transformation, and that there's such inertia in our society, so so we don't necessarily know, you know, how to address it. And so, you know, I, I present a bunch of ideas and solutions, and then also, for me personally, the Evolver, this organization, this company that I started, is an effort to put those into practice. Um, to see what happens if you get local communities kind of inspired, and you find people who uh, share a new vision, a new intention for what could happen, and then set them loose, you know? And actually, Graham, you've been you know, dealing with some of the Evolver people as you go around the country. Um, so let me turn it back over to you and ask you, um, we were just talking before we, we, we started really talking, um, about um, your evolving sense of, of 2012 and kind of like our like, responsibility and, and, and how that's reflected in, in, in your recent works. Uh, yeah, I, I first came, came across 2012 as an issue when I was researching and, and writing Fingerprints of the Gods. And Fingerprints of the Gods was published in 1995, and the, the research work on it was primarily done between 1991 and 1994. And this is when I came across the uh, Mayan calendar, and it's uh, the end date of the current cycle uh, on the 21st of December uh, 2012. Uh, and the whole burden and, and message of uh, fingerprints of the gods was that there might have been uh, a huge forgotten episode in human history, uh, that we might have lost a whole chapter in the story of civilization, a, a high civilization that, uh, ex that was capable of navigating the world, capable of mapping the world, um, and that was brought to an end by the cataclysmic events uh, that ended uh, the last ice age. And it seemed to me that there had been survivors and that they had settled in many different parts of the world and had passed down a legacy of knowledge to the future. Uh, and, and when I looked at the Mayan calendar and its incredible uh, scientific accuracy, uh, the fact that it um, uh, has a, a better estimate of the length of the solar year that we use in, in our calendar uh, today. Uh, the fact that they could tell you the, the particular, if you like, the particular day of the week that the moon was on a particular phase, you know, 22,000 years in the past or 22,000 years in the future. Uh, it's just an extraordinary calculating, uh, calculating device and it seemed to me uh, to be a candidate for one of those for one of those fingerprints of the gods. And I started to wonder, uh, is there, was there uh, a, an attempt by the survivors to pass down a message and perhaps even a, a warning to the future? And it's why uh, in England, though, though not in the US, the subtitle of Fingerprints of the Gods was a quest for the beginning and the end. Uh, and, and there definitely was a cataclysmic uh, element in uh, Fingerprints of the Gods. Uh, first of all, dealing with the, the, the horrific events at the end of the last ice age, and then, and then wondering, was there some kind of cyclical process at work here that uh, we were being warned of uh, for, the, for the future? Um, and I kind of segued from the Mayan calendar to the, to the Aztec calendar, and the Aztec calendar is, is um, in a way even more extremely cataclysmic and, and sees the ending of the fifth sun, our, our current age, as being brought about by a great uh, movement of the earth. So there was this element of, of uh, darkness and, uh, and, and a warning in fingerprints of the gods. As the years have gone by, I've um, I found that uh, my views on this have begun to change. Uh, first of all, uh, I think it's important to be clear that the Mayan calendar nowhere says that the world will come to an end on the 21st of December 2012.